Hello and welcome back to my channel and today I thought I'd do something different again. Last week we did a collection showcase and thanks if you watched that video. Um, yeah and this week we're going to be doing something different again. We're going to be doing something I haven't done before and it is a ranking. It's not a top 10 because I actually have 12 places for this because I'm going to be ranking today Seasons 1 through 11 of New Who, plus the specials, yes, so I've given the specials their own little place instead of including them as part of Series 4, which I probably should have done, but I decided I wanted to do a separate place, because, you know. Um, but yeah, so we'll get on with it, and in last place is... So in 12th or last place is Series 7. Now, I've never really... And to this day, understood this series. I mean, to go off Series 6, which was met at best, and Series 5, which is one of the best series to date, I think, to this. Um, I think with this series, it's a lot of the combination of Matt and Jenna in Series 7 Part 2, which I really didn't like. Uh, I did not like their relationship at all. I thought it was very forced and it didn't really work. And Clara was at her most annoying in this series. And I think so was the 11th Doctor as well. I think the stories as well weren't weren't as engaging as previous stories. I mean, there are stories here that I like. For example, The Angels Take Manhattan is a fitting farewell to the Ponds. But why did they come back for half a series? Literally... For five episodes when they had a perfectly good ending in series six although a bit rushed I think um, it just seems a bit like you already brought, you already ended them and you're bringing them back for five episodes I mean what was the point in that it just means you have an awkward relationship issues that we have to solve in Asylum of the Daleks and it just leads with so many issues with part one are caused by the fact that um, Amy Pond and Rory came back I think the relationship with Brian, although I think Brian's all right, um, I don't really think it was necessary. I thought I would probably like Series 7 a lot more if Clara and the Doctor had that, had that relationship from the start, or if we'd seen more of the splinters um, of Clara, although I didn't like that story arc and didn't think it was, you know, a relevant, re really good story arc or anything. I thought it would at least make the series more consistent if you'd been just doing that and focusing on meeting different splinters in the first half. Because then you have the mystery building up when you meet um, proper Clara in the present day and we start to understand more. It would make the finale have a greater payoff, I think. Um, it's a pretty flimsy ending, if I'm honest. The finale is not very good. I might do a rank of finales, I don't know. But I think that might be another good idea. But this one was a popular one, so I did this instead. Um, but, yeah, it's just... It's a bit, it seems a bit off-handed and sort of rushed. Even though this is probably one of the series that took the longest to make. I mean, literally, they aired half of it in 2012 and the other half in 2013. And given that that was the... Series 7 Part 1 was the only episodes to air in 2012, it's one of the few seasons I actually remember seeing down and watching, it was just so disappointing to know that, um, you know, this series, I've been waiting so long to return, and it is just lacklustre. I know they were trying to make it like a blockbuster each episode, and that was only, re that was only represented in the nice cool posters, that I really want an art card of each one. I've been collecting art cards recently for um, my Doctor Who wall, which I did since I, uh, since I, since just over half time, I just started doing them since the collection video. I did a nice little thing. Maybe I'll show you at the end, I guess. But it's just like that was the only cinematic part of it. There wasn't really any cinematic thing to it that was really that interesting I mean the stories were, certainly weren't as you know c captivating as more recent series is. I think series 11 does a better job of feeling more cinematic than this series as we'll find out because in 11th place or penultimate place is series 11 and I have not known a series so divisive and to shake the Whovian fandom in such a way. Since probably Series 7, I think this is probably very divisive as a series. And the reason I didn't put this in last place, and trust me, I had a long time 
thinking about whether I should put this in last place is because if I'm honest, a lot of the episodes here is just a pass. I mean, none of them are doing anyone much harm, really. They're just bits of Doctor Who and it's ultimately bits of fluff in some places. I mean, there are episodes here that I could consider bad and there are only a couple of them, if I'm honest, really. I mean, the witch findings in the Saranga conundrum are the only ones that I call definitively bad and probably the Ranscore, Battle of Ranscore of Kolos, only because it's a finale and it feels just like your run of the mill episode. But what I will give to it is it feels much more cinematic in scope and in storytelling than Series 7. I think it achieved that quite well. And when I heard that they were trying to do the cinematic thing again, I thought, oh god because I didn't think it would work out at all. But in this sense, I think it does feel like a little mini-movie in each way, in each story. I mean, you've got the Avengers and you've got the Avengers Infinity War, kind of, I guess you could say, um, which is Woman Who Fell to Earth, and then you have sort of the Avengers Endgame, I guess you could say, um, being the Battle of Ranscore of Kolos, even though it doesn't have great payoff. Another series finale without great payoff. I would be willing to say, and I probably will if I do do a ranking, is it contains the worst series finale. Um, but really, if I'm honest, the season opener, The Woman Who Fell to Earth, is actually a pretty decent season opener. And I'd probably put it above quite a few season openers. I guess I'm, I'll do that at some point as well. But yeah, and then there are some episodes in this that I do like, like Rosa, which I thought was outstanding. I think that's what probably the only outstanding story here. But also, it takes you away. I actually really quite like that story. Um, I thought the ending was... was It was just harmless Doctor Who. Like, how can you not think that a frog is not okay but you can think bubble wrap is fine the previous week or that you think oh the the frog is not okay but you're perfectly fine to be terrified of shadows and weird crystal things that we still don't know what it is i mean that's a strange thing from midnight like come on but yeah you know the frog is a harmless bit of doctor who fun i don't get why people are like up in arms about that at all because i thought it was a decent ending to the episode it made sense it was built up on and they explained it it was you know, foreshadowed, and it worked out. So I don't know why there's such a hatred for that episode. But then again, I have still put it quite low down, and there is a reason for that. The dialogue, <laughs> in some cases. Um, the underuse of the companions, I think, that's really, it's really too crowded. Uh, the scripts, there are a lot of script issues there. And the stories are generally quite, generally quite weak, but... Yeah, there's a lot here that I don't really like, and there's a lot here that I do like. For example, without Series 11, we would not have this lovely lenticular DVD slip, and by far the most recent, the best Doctor Who DVD that we've had in a whole long time, um, apart from the Classic Who box sets, which look gorgeous, I have to say. I bought the Season 18 one, I'm not allowed it yet, but it's gorgeous. I, I, I've never seen a DVD box set like it. But yeah, and the beautiful art cards. I think the best thing about Series 11, in my opinion, was the art, promotional art. I just love the promotional art. And it does it adds to that cinematic scope that I think Series 7 was aiming for, but missed. Because I think this had a budget increase, these different cameras. It feel, Each episode does feel, to their credit, like a mini-movie. So I'm going to give them credit for that, at the very least. So, in 10th place is... Series 6. Now, what have I got to say about Series 6? Dear God, there's a lot I could say. Uh, I think the first half is actually its saving grace. It's the second half that's just a bit, well, I'm not going to say, but uh, it's just not very good. Um, the second half, there are some good stories, I will give it. Night Terrors and the Girl Who Weighted are actually pretty decent. But the rest of it is just fluff. I mean, closing time, the wedding of River Song, let's kill Hitler for goodness sake. This this is just this half is quite possibly some of the worst Doctor Who that I think we've seen. Um I think the, the But the thing is it does have a great heart. It does have a great first half. Um there are some stories in the first half I don't necessarily think are very good. For example, the Curse of the Black Spot isn't that good. Um you know I can't remember the other, the other one that wasn't very good, but there was another one that I didn't really like. Um, there's, the opener was genuinely climatic. I remember at the time, I was still quite young at the time. I think I would have been about six or something when this series aired. Yeah, this is like in between this, like in between, I don't, I'm sorry, bold Sarah Jane, which isn't really that um, respectful given that she just died 
eight years ago, but uh, uh, yeah. But in between the gap between series six part one and series six part two, I went to the Doctor Who experience. The first half had me so hyped for the second half. And then when I watched the second half, I was like, why was I so hyped? And that was me as a six-year-old, people. Um, I mean, look at this box set. It's so battered because I watched it so many times in between. I know the Series 6 box set is quite battered as well, but it's nowhere near as battered and nowhere near as used. I, I used to love watching Series 6 Part 1. The Rebel Flesh 2 part, oh, great stuff, honestly. Um, but yeah, it's just not very well complemented by Series 6 Part 2, if I'm honest. Um... I mean, they just had they had a great build up and not a very good payoff. Is what I have to say about the series. Apart from that, like music and set design and the acting is all there. It's all great. And again, we have the sort of ending to Amy Pond and Rory's storyline here. And to be honest, I wish they'd just gone with what they did because what they ended up dragging them out through series seven, part one. No matter how much I like Angels Tent Manhattan, it probably would have just been better off if we'd just had their ending in this, and it might have just might have just improved series 7 just a little bit um i mean series 7 was supposed to like series 7 part 2 was supposed to be the 50th anniversary year for goodness sake but yeah there's there's a lot here i'm i will say for all of these series there is something that i like it's not last place because i just hate it completely but um it just means it's not as good as other series in my opinion that's another thing i have to stress this is my opinion don't be disheartened if um your favourite series is um, lower down um, on this list. I know a lot of people will probably be quite disappointed that I don't like series 11 that much. It's not because of Jodie Whittaker, actually. I do actually like Jodie Whittaker, so I guess you can't call me a sexist, at least. Um, but I do like series 11, I do. Um, and I like Graham, and I like Ryan. I just think... And I think Yaz is genuinely the best out of Ryan and her. I think that if she had better growth she could be better i uh, know we're talking we're on series six and i'm still talking about series 11 seriously like, these these three seasons i think are the most divisive of every any series of doctor who i think this series in particular is very overcomplicated and not very straightforward which i think a lot of people's complaint with series 11 was that it was straightforward so i guess you can never win i guess Stephen moffat and chris chibnall you don't, the fans never know what they want. I think that's that's the real problem. That the fans never know what they want, really. Uh, I, I I I will come forward about that. I don't really know at this point what I want from series twelve. I want a better series, but I can I like overcomplicated arcs and I like simple arcs. You just have to find the fine line between what is good and what is bad. I mean, the Bad Wolf arc is very good. I think they have the potential for a good arc with the Timeless Child. And I think the arc between Graham, Ryan and Grace was also pretty good. But this, this is also just, this is just trash. I mean, come on. It's trash, 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 trash. Well, that's not so much trash, but that is trash. Burn. So, in ninth place, we have the specials. And I have chosen this one case deliberately because it displays quite accurately that this, 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 these four episodes, or is it five? You have three, yet five episodes. These five episodes split me a bit. And I think they split the fa Whovian fan community as well. Uh, I don't know. But I'm actually quite a big fan of The Next Doctor. I do like that Christmas special. I think it's one of the best New Who Cybermen stories. I mean, that it's not, very, it's not like there's that many that we could pick from, really. I mean, let's face it, the... Nightmare in Silver is hardly going to be my favourite Doctor Who story. Neither is Closing Time. But, I mean, there, were, there, haven't, there haven't been that many... Class, there haven't been any, many Cybermen stories. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, the, the next Doctor is actually one of my favourite. I think I'll put it quite high up on my list. I think, I think the idea of the Doctor travelling alone without a constant companion is an interesting one. But I don't think it's really the one that I would have done with David Tennant. I would maybe have done this with Peter Capaldi. I think Peter Capaldi and his companions weren't necessarily very good. I think I can imagine Peter Capaldi travelling around the universe alone being much more compelling than David Tennant travelling alone for a few episodes. I think with Peter Capaldi I would have done it for a full series. Peter Capaldi is by far one of the best actors to ever grace the role of Doctor Who. So is David Tennant, but I think David Tennant's possibly the best. But, um, you know, that might be another ranking altogether. Um, but yeah, so this entails the Doctor and the arc of the four knocks. I think, again, it's a nice, simplistic sort of arc. 
And it makes this feel separate from most other series of Doctor Who, probably. I mean, I, I, I think I would call this a series. I don't think I would n number it a series, but I think I would call it a series on its own, because it has its own arc over four episodes. I think the Warnock thing was introduced in Planet of the Dead, um, which is not a very good story. I think there were a lot of mistakes it made. I think, really, we could have just done with the Waters of Mars. We didn't need Planet of the Dead. If anything, I think Planet of the Dead sort of weakens this quite severely and it makes the issues with the end of time more obvious. I think if you had removed it, you would have just had the end of time that I'm not too keen on. I think end of time is a bit milked. Uh, yeah, I know. It's pretty common to think that. But yeah, the story with the Master, I think, although alright, it's just... It feels like it's not the focus of the story. It feels quite often that the attention is drawn onto David Tennant and not him saving the, regener so the regeneration. It feels like it's focused on that rather than the story. I think that's a common problem with regeneration stories. In the classic era, my favourite era probably, um, the, the idea of regeneration was just an idea, oh, it's being passed on to another actor. I mean, from all the regeneration stories that I've seen, it's just a story with a regeneration at the end. And I think that's the best way to do a regeneration, because otherwise it takes away from the story of the episode, as well as milking it a lot. Um, which is why, when you get good episodes like Waters of Mind, it makes them feel more special, because if David Tennant wanted to regenerate at the end of that, I think we would have let uh, David Tennant as a Doctor and we went on a huge journey with that story. Um, it was a very different kind of story. He learned that that was... That, that that he became the Time Lord Victorious. And I think if he had regenerated at the end of that lesson, it would be like he was paying the price of doing that, rather than spending 15, 10 to 15 minutes um, saying goodbye to his companions, which I think wasn't a great idea, really. But yeah, and then you got the next Doctor, which is very good, and then there's pretty much it, really. It's just very milked, and there are some good stories, but the pilot, the pilot of the Dead is diluted. I think... Next Doctor's pretty good, and then the end of time is just milked. Uh, Water to Mars is sublime. Seriously, that is one of the greatest stories I've ever seen. The monsters are so creepy, it terrified me as a young guy, boy. I did not want to go in the bath for several months, and my mum hated me. Uh, and I can probably imagine why. But yes, moving on to the eighth place is... Oh, I had to think about this, because... The way I rank the Peter Capaldi series is probably very interesting in the fact that I think it probably got better as it went along, if I'm honest. But this series... Mm, yeah, this series is just not good. Um, the Clara, to be fair with Clara, she is slightly improved here. Um, she's got... it's. She is the main floor of the series, she's part of it. But only because Danny Pink and her have one of the worst relationships I've ever seen on TV. And the way he's killed off is just so annoying that it hurts. Because this is quite an interesting series. I think there are some good stories in here and there are some not so good. I mean, the caretaker is just... It's not... It's not very good. It's just not. The Skybox Blitzer is a great villain, and I think he was really badly used in this story, if I'm honest. But um, there's a lot of stories that I do like. A personal favourite of mine is the Time Heist. Oh, is it just Time Heist? I think it's just Time Heist. But I think that was quite good. I think the monster was quite compelling, and the whole Doctor Who does a heist story was quite cinematic, actually. Um, and Deep Breath, one of the best regeneration post-regeneration stories, I think, is by far the best one out there, I think. Um, also, Peter Capaldi's performance is by far the saving grace of any 12th Doctor series, if I'm honest. Um, he is fabulous in the role, truly splendid, and I have no... I don't think I have the words to compliment his acting. He's by far the most one of the most prestigious actors to take on the role of the Doctor. And um, I think that's really good. I think that really works as the Doctor. And I think it's disappointing to me that the Whovian community that have been watching Doctor Who for the last seven years, refu I think, gave up on him in a way. I think that's probably partially one of the reasons why Doctor Who 
started to get worse is because I think the writers felt slightly disheartened a bit um, and started to feel like, oh, no one cares anymore. Uh, and I think Peter Capaldi ploughed through it. I think I think it will be a shame that Peter Capaldi probably won't be one of the most remembered Doctors because I think he de- genuinely deserves to be. I think he's one of the best role. I think the he's like Colin Baker. I love Colin Baker um, as well in the role. He's, he is Colin Baker, essentially. He's just an older version of the Doctor. And I feel like viewers tuned off because he was an old man. Uh, and it's very evident that they did. Um... <laughs> People just didn't like him the same way they liked other Doctors, which is why it's annoying, because his performance is just so good. Uh, I wish more pre- people appreciated him. But yeah, the uh, the arc with Missy was actually, although predictable, uh, this, is, this is the point where the arcs became complicated but predictable. Um, I mean, you could obviously tell that Missy was the master. I predicted it all those years ago, and I was ten, so... Yeah, let's face it, it's hardly the hardest plot to work out. I desperately wished that I was wrong. I wanted it to be Susan, I wanted it to be the Rani, I wanted it to be any number of other characters, but deep down I knew it would be Missy. Um, To be fair, there are a lot of stories that are forgettable in this series as well as some of them are memorable. The series finale is very good, I will give them that. Um, But episodes like Robot of Sherwood and Into the Dalek and... All these stories that just feel a bit flimsy, if I'm honest. Especially into um, In the Forest of the Night. Very, it feels very flimsy. But yeah, moving on into seventh place is... You guessed it, Series 10. I don't know how many of you guessed this. But I do like the series. I think Bill Potts is a marked improvement on Clara Oswald. I think his relationship, her relationship rather, with the Doctor and Nardole is best Doctor Who companion dynamic of them all. They're by far the most memorable TARDIS team, if I'm honest. I think Bill Potts is just... She's just amazing. Like, I can put up with her terrible action figure and be happy that she got one at all, because... I mean, just, like, Bill Potts is amazing. Look at her. She's so fun, and she's so relatable in many respects. Even if you're not, like, a lesbian or anything, or... Her, just her relationship with the Doctor and so on. I think she was by far one of the best characters because she was more like Donna and stuff. I think lots of people appreciated her inclusion in the series. This is the, um, this is the ideal representation. This is an example of how representation has been done right. Um, in series 11, I think representation was done very poorly. But having Bill Potts be a character that's integral to the series, yet... Her her point, her political point of view is not the focus of the series, I think is the way that you should work a diverse universe. I think it's the way to do it so people know about it and accept it. I think it works as a character, um, but doesn't feel like it's just there to make a point. She's there to be a character. She's there to be integral to the story. She's not there just to pop up and do things or just to pop up and make a point. She's like, she ha- she's more to her, there's more to her. She's a character, and she feels more natural than, say, the characters that are just forced to say a line, which makes the political point, and then die. I think it's better to do it than to make other people sigh, because it makes her character relatable overall. I mean, I'm not gay in any way, and I still love Bill Potts. And it proves that you don't have to be of that political agenda to like a character, I think. And I think that's just the way it should go, if I'm honest. Um, and the stories here are slightly weaker, if I'm honest. But the series finale, my gosh. Like, the, that final two-parter is by far the best two-parter Stephen Moffat had done during his tenure as showrunner. I say that because he did a lot of good stories outside of his tenure. I think that's probably because he was so stressed out from doing Doctor Who and Sherlock. I mean, that's probably why series six and seven aren't very good. Um... Although he did do series 5 at the same time as Sherlock series 1, I think. He was working at about the same time, or was it series 6? But he, he was doing Sherlock and, Doc, and Doctor Who, and he just had too much of his plate, I think, as a serious art. It's the real answer to why Doctor Who at this point wasn't very good. I mean, when he was doing series 10, he was doing Sherlock as well. I think he was doing Sherlock series 4. Yeah, yeah, Sherlock series 4. So he's doing quite a bit. But he he did he can still do a good series and I think this series has a good arc. It has a great arc for the first half of the series and it has a great arc sort of for the second series. And the arc overall is Missy again. Um, um Stephen Moffat must love Missy. I I have to say to build two arcs around her. 
he really must have liked her, you know? Um, I mean, the first half, working out who's in the vault, yeah, it was predictable, but it had a decent payoff, I have to admit. And then there is some, in the second half, Missy's Redemption, I think there's also, it has a great payoff in the series finale, where she stands up to her older self, and she becomes, she grows as a person, and I really hope we get to see the Master again, perhaps in a less villainous role. I think Chris Chibnall will probably be able to do that quite well. And Chris Chibnall's probably proven that he can do some character work. Yeah, like, people say that the story arc of Series 11, it's a character story. Yeah, he, he has developed characters, to be fair, but he's also just doing a lot of diversity to make a point rather than being a character with a reason. I think that's yes, the story of Yaz's life, really. Um, but Bill, she she is the example and the way, the role, the person to follow in integrating diversity into Doctor Who, which I know is hasn't always been great at diversity. I know, but like a lot of people say it hasn't always been great. To be fair, it has had some of the most influential probably in some respects as well i mean just look at the companion role the things that susan was able to do as a companion although she was crying and screaming and tripping all over the face place she was intelligent she was smart and i think doctor who was the first time that um female characters were able to play that role i think now we're seeing the, another surge of relevance and representation to doctor who which i think is good i think it's like, even if I don't necessarily agree with that point that they're making, I think I can still appreciate that they include it because it's educating me as a person to other people's lives and other people's political views rather than me being just in a shell of, you know, like, you, even if the episode makes me hate that political point, like, you know, some episodes do it in a tasteless fashion, but some episodes do it, do it in a good representation. I think series 10 is the best way to do representation. I think Stephen Moffat was the best person to do that with. Um, I don't think um, Chris Jibben has done it well at all. And again, Russell T Davis has integrated diversity quite well into Doctor Who as well. But yeah, we'll get on to that in another place because we're going to move on to... I don't know what place we're at now, so we're going to move on to the next one. Which is... Series 9. Now, I don't know necessarily what a lot of people complain about with this series. I mean, there are maybe three episodes that I could pick out as not being very good, but the rest of the series is thoroughly enjoyable. Um, I mean, I love Heaven Sent. I'm not so keen on the first half of the opening two-parter, but it's still, overall, if you watch the episodes back-to-back, -back, you get the full payoff. It's still a very thrilling story. I think this series has some of the best um, stories of the Capaldi era and the Moffat era. I mean, Face the Raven, the Saigon Invasion and Saigon Inversion are simply sublime, in my opinion. They're some of the greatest Doctor Who stories, along with Heaven Sent, although it was a bit spoiled by um, Hell Ben. I think the rest of the series is thoroughly enjoyable, you know? Um, I mean, the, the whole me storyline isn't very good, but Clara in this series, I think, is probably very good and I think she gets a satisfying ending in Face of the Raven which is again ruined by um, the Husbands of River Song. I mean Clara is just like great in the series and I mean come on like come on who didn't love Under the Lake and Before the Flood like come on seriously did you not like that because it's great it, I love that story and maybe Sleep No More isn't very good either but you know and the woman who fell to earth oh I mean not the woman who fell to earth that's series 11 rather again we keep bringing up series 11 <laughs> It's like, it's the haunting series. Um, the series that haunts us all. But, um, yeah. I mean, the woman who lived, I think it is, the woman who lived. Yeah, the woman who lived is actually a nice period piece, actually. I think there's a fun little story there, although I didn't like it so much. But I still thought it was fun. I mean, you can get entertainment out of any of these episodes, if I'm honest. I, mean, I still find entertainment out entertaining aspects of Hellbent. And although I don't like the way Clara's ended in the story by basically ripping off Donna and the Doctor's exit. I mean, it, it makes it for an interesting one where the Doctor sort of... Doctor, his memory's wiped, which is more interesting in Series 10 than this, if I'm honest, the way that's built up. But yeah, there's some great stories in here. I'm really kind of weirded out by the fact that a lot of people think the series isn't that good. I mean, there's some great moments in here. And of course, Peter Capaldi's performance is at its best in the series. The way he's able to pull off Heaven Sent, a ser an episode without any other actors except the person playing the weird fly thing is incredible and truly a testament to his 
role as the Doctor and his tenure, and it shocks me that more people don't love this series. I mean, it's just some great telly, you know? Um, I mean, like, Series 11 got nominated for awards. It got nominated um, for some awards. It didn't win any as such. I think it won a couple, but not really any like popular ones. Like I mean, a lot of people were saying, well, why isn't Jodie Whittaker got an award for her role as the Doctor? But when Peter Capaldi didn't get one for Heaven Sent, I don't know any world I could imagine that being fair at all. Because Peter Capaldi, my gosh, the performance he gave, Peter Capaldi is the Doctor. I would probably give him very high up on top ranking all the Doctors if Heaven Sent had been his only episode. It's just... It's, the great one of the great series of Doctor Who, if I'm honest. And yeah, there are good bits of fluff here, you know. Peter, it's very obvious Stephen Moffat was getting a bit running out of steam a bit, but this is way better than any of the stuff he did with Matt Smith. Why it disappoints me that not many people like Peter Capaldi as a Doctor. But yeah, those are the three seasons of Peter Capaldi. It's just occurred to me, uh, I did them in consecutive order, uh, but as in they weren't, you know, all like in order of broadcast or anything but it does show that I think this was the high point of the Capaldi tenure with him and Clara and I do think the idea of her becoming a bit overpowered was a bit annoying but I think it's, it works for her character she became too much like the Doctor that she had to let go and I think that makes sense as a story arc if I'm honest I mean it's more it's be, it makes more sense than the story arc with Clara or series that six six, six or, you know it's it's a straightforward arc. I think the kind of arc that I would expect from Chris Chibnall going forward, I hope, because it's a character arc, and that's what Chris Chibnall is very well known for. So I'll be expecting arcs like this in the future from Chris Chibnall, because it's very similar to what he did with Series 11. But yeah, I really like this series. I don't know why more people don't. But yes, moving on is... In next place we have series two, and I honestly can't tell you really what I love about the series so much. I just guess it's that personal fondness with certain stories such as New Earth, which are probably hated by quite a few people. I know it's genuinely thought as the weakest season opener, but I quite like it. Um, I used to watch it a lot on replay. It was one of the first stories I ever got on DVD. Girl in the Fireplace is one of my absolute favourites. The relationship between David Tennant and Billy Piper as Rose Tyler and the Doctor is just fabulous. I love their chemistry. I think it's probably the best relationship we're ever going to get in Doctor Who. Much better than I think Matt Smith and Alex Kingston could do as the Doctor and River in that relationship. I think the relationship between... David Tennant, the Doctor and Rose is much stronger in that sense. And also the development of Mickey in this series is also quite interesting. Um, School Reunion, where they brought back this Sarah Jane and K-9. It's just full of nostalgic memories. And I think this is probably one of those series that I'll just look back on as just one of my personal favourites. Even if lots of people don't really necessarily agree with me. I just like this series. And I find things I like in all of these episodes. I think Fear Her, I always like The Scribble Monster, and Love, even in those two stories, you know, and in Love and Monsters, which those two stories are considered quite poor. But I still find things I enjoy about them, you know? I find... Um, I used to find the Absorbal off genuinely scary, um, so I'll always look back at that and think, you know, that was once scared me at one point. I'll, I'll give you fair play for that, you know. Um, and I thought the concept of the Doctor Who fan community was quite interesting, even if they are the weakest stories of the series, and yes, they are. Um, they're still not as necessarily bad as episodes such as the Saranga Conundrum or the Witchfinders, in my opinion. Again, this is my opinion, so. Um, don't if you're if I speak about a story that you like, you know, I'm sorry I don't I don't like it, but don't let me just take that away from you, you know. Um, I mean there are stories that I like that a lot of people don't like. For example, this series as a whole, it's just genuinely thought to be the weaker series. I think it probably is the weaker series of the Rossity Davis era. And if I wanted to, I could probably have ranked it higher. But I know that it, it probably doesn't really deserve to be ranked higher. There's just a lot here that I like. I like the David Tennant finding his feet as the Doctor is very interesting. And the finale is absolutely heart-wrenching. I, I cry every time. And, like, even when I first watched it, I cried. You know? It's just such a great emotional series with such fond memories for me. I just, like, love this series for that. Next up we have Series 5. Yes. 
Um, um, this is the first series. This is the highest, obviously. Um, um, Stephen Moffat series, if you're paying attention. Um, but yeah, this is the highest Matt Smith um series as well. And this is the first series that I can properly remember sitting down and watching every episode. I can give memories about how we ran into a hotel and we missed the first few minutes of Time and Angel, Time of the Angels. And flesh and stone because we were in a hotel in Wales, believe it or not. Uh, we were in Wales when series five was going out, um, which was fun, like you know, about that midpoint. I don't know if it was like a holiday or anything, or if I was still too young to be in school at that point. But um, I remember watching the series, I remember getting DWM, like I remember getting back and seeing, I mean, not DWM, DWA. I remember getting back after coming from Wales and getting all catch up on the DWAs that I missed while. Um, I was away. Uh, this is the series that I first felt like this is a full roller coaster adventure, and I absolutely loved it at the time. Like tuning in, reading the first DWA, and reading the preview, and seeing all the images from the new series, and getting so excited about this series. So again, this is probably quite high up. Not only because it does have some good stories, but because of that nostalgia factor that series two gives me. Um, but yeah, series five, like the relationship between the Doctor and Amy is. Th it's, again, it's one of the best companion duos, I think, when it's just the Doctor and Amy. I'm not so keen on Rory, if I'm honest, um, but I love that relationship between the Doctor and Amy. And I think River Song at this point was quite interesting. We still didn't know a lot about her. So when she appeared in the Weeping Angel two-parter and the series finale, it was quite intriguing as well, learning a bit by bit about her. And just like struggling to piece the pieces together about who she might be and the references of is she going to be your wife one day was also quite intriguing because it was kind of foreshadowing now that we look back at it because of course River Song ended up being his wife um so you know it was a lot of nostalgia factor in this series being quite high up again there are some good stories Vincent the Doctor I do really like that story I think it's another quite like the girl in the fireplace a nice emotional roller coaster with a historical figure and it's the thing I like about Rosa, it's just that like having that subtle, um, that subtle, um, that subtle sci-fi element in a big historical episode where you learn more about these people. Less so in The Girl in the Fireplace, but yes, in the case of Vincent van Gogh, we're learning about his depression, his suicide eventually in that episode. And it's very similar, you can draw parallels to Rosa in the sense that there's that small sci-fi element, but it brings the episode together as a Doctor who -y sort of story. Um... Yeah, the, the finale, the crack thing, I was like, on that, as a kid, I was like, what is this crack? I didn't really know by the end of series five either. Like, the exploding TARDIS is obviously, but what caused the TARDIS to explode? That thing with the silence, it's just, it's like, roughly trying to pull everything together, and my young mind was blown at the end, of, um, when the show, when the story finally came to an end with Time and the Doctor, it's like... Oh my gosh, I got it completely wrong. But um, yeah, there's just a nostalgia factor to this. The relationship between the companion and the, the Stephen Moffat's writing at this point is really some of the best that he did for the show. Um, the Beast Below, I also look back at with strong memories. Um, the Eleventh Hour, I have eaten fish fingers and custard, and it was actually not that bad. Um, so yeah, it's. I just really like this series. It's the best in the Matt Smith series. I think the bit, the series that Matt Smith feels the most like the Doctor and Stephen Moffat was his, this is best best run. I think it was really good at restarting the show and making it feel fresh and new. And next up is to the top three with series one. And again, there's a heavy um, aspect of um, nostalgia in this series being placed where it is I mean in the story alone Aliens of London and World War 3 I have watched countless times um, I don't know if it was probably mainly because it's the only story my sister would watch um, I guess that's probably because of the farting aliens more of the interesting plot but I don't think that story deserves to get put down as much as it does I know a lot of people don't like that story um, but yeah I don't know if it was the farting aliens or the politics or whatever that intrigued my sister so much about the story, but it was the only one she'd watch. So we watched that a lot when we were younger. Because again, this was one of the very few um, seasons that I had DVDs for. In fact, this was the only complete season I had. So I'd be watching these episodes on loop. So I guess that's kind of tinted my, tainted rather, my view 
of these episodes. Um, Christopher Eccleston, another under, underrated and overlooked doctor, I think, in my opinion, he gives a fabulous performance, and his regeneration story, in my opinion, is the best handover, because it doesn't focus on the ippy soppy um, aspects of a of the Doctor regenerating. I mean, we didn't know... Well, I didn't know. I know a lot of people did know that Christopher Eccleston would only be doing this one series, but I didn't know at the time that Christopher Eccleston, the Ninth Doctor, would leave when I watched this, because obviously when I watched it, he'd already left and so on. But, you know, I, I, I grew attached to this Doctor because I watched him so much. I did love this series. I mean, there's something I can enjoy. In fact, I would be willing to say that I love all of these episodes. I think for the top three, there's not an episode from the series that, that I don't like. Um, particularly in the RTD era, these first three, well, this first series and the other two series, there isn't really an episode that I could definitively say that I don't hate. I love all of them in this series. There's something I love about all of them. It's just a great plot all of them the theme bad wolf and the way the dalek story all comes together in the end of um the series makes for a sweet and climatic finale and it sort of ties together the whole christopher eccleston era and how rose helps him to move on from the time war and i think that really works as a great narrative for this series so in the second to last place, which series will it be? If you've been paying attention, there's only two seasons that can be left. And that's series three and four. So which one will be in second place? So oh, in second place is series three. And this is another series that um I got quite early on. My mum got it in a HMV sale. Um well she got really cheap. So it was another series that I would constantly watch on loops. Um, like the uh, Rossi, the Stephen Moffat series is, I didn't watch so much on loop because even then I didn't really like them as much as these stories. Um, I mean, the reason I have such good, m such memories of them is because I watched them when they went out. These ones, I watched them when they went out, but I wasn't knowledgeable <laughs> that I watched them when they went out. These were the stories that I watched in between series, um, re-watching these over and over again. So stories like Daleks in Manhattan and Evolution of the Daleks, like I didn't know about anyone else's opinions on them, so I found the concept of a human Dalek absolutely captivating. I think it was an incredibly interesting thing to investigate, to, to talk about, because after all, there have been so many humans who are so similar to Daleks. In fact, the Daleks themselves were based off the Nazis. So, like, to have a human Dalek is an interesting concept as well. And having um, the scarecrows, they scared me. I actually went to the filming location, as I said, um, when I was talking about Series 5, I was in Wales, and one of the filming locations that we went to was the Series 3 story human nature and the family of blood um we watched we went to filming locations we went into that village where you know the sequence where he uses the ball to stop the piano falling on the pram we saw that sequence um where it was filmed and i just have such great memories of going up around the fields where the scarecrows were and <laughs> i think i mentioned this before with the pig story where i had to go to a jumble set and buy a dvd um and so yeah it's one of those stories that i just have great memories of the weeping angels they weren't so scary for me believe it or not they were scaring my mum but not me um you know but stories like new earth Trilogy? I actually really like the New Earth trilogy. It's a trilogy I've watched constantly, you know. Um, I love the characters, Novice Hain, the face of Bo. I even like Cassandra. I always wanted a Cassandra figure. I was kind of disappointed. I uh, when I finally got one, it was the broken without Cassandra flesh, which I can only assume was because it was much cheaper than getting one with the actual skin in the frame. I did actually get one of them last year. I was so happy because it's a figure that I've wanted for ages. If these stories are personal to me, I think that makes my... I think At the end of the day, the reason you're going to subscribe to my channel over other channels is because if you want my opinion. I know that's not really saying much given that I only have 16 subscribers, but... Um, 
the exclusive thing here that you can't get anywhere else is my opinion. So me talking about my exclusive, like my favourite stories, my personal ones, I think is important. And that's why I think series is like series two and series three are quite high up for me. Um, but of course, it's very predictable what's next. Um, but yeah, um, Freeman Adjaman also um, gave a fantastic performance. I think the only episode in this entire series that I could say I didn't find as interesting was 42. Um, but even that has some... The, this chilling sun monster type thing was so compelling. And it was so Chris Chibnall. <laughs> so Chris Chibnall. Um, now that we know what he the kind of thing he does with Doctor Who. David Tennant gives... I'm sorry... I'm sorry, Series 4 fans, but David Tennant's best performance is in this series. You will not ever be able to find a better David Tennant performance than in Human Nature, Family of Blood, the, the season finale, his interactions with the Master, um, and John Sim and Derek Jacobi is... It's chilling. Um, it's some of the best acting Doctor Who will ever see, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, Freeman Adjiman, Captain Jack Harkness, they're all here in the Sea Witch finale. It, it's just, it's great fun. And I, I think the arc of Vote Saxon really, really works and keeps you guessing. But predictably, for um, I'm, most of you, I'm sure, is in first place is Series 4. Um, this is what most people choose as their number one spot. Um, I know a lot of people pick Series 5, but I'm not too keen on that, personally. But yeah. Series four, <laughs> um, like in the comments section, tell me if you predicted this because let's face it, if anyone views this who's in the Doctor Who Whovian community, they will just know that it's series four at the start. I mean, again, this this is an interesting one because this is a series that I did not have until a couple of years ago. I relied on repeats and stuff, which is why I was so, so overwhelmed when I got to watch this again because I had not watched it. Again, this is one of the very few series that I can remember watching. Uh, I, I can just... And this is the first sort of one that I can... I can remember bits of it. The specials I really started to remember, particularly End of Time, just being gut-wrenched at the end of that. Um, but this, I can remember fragments. I can remember watching Science in the Library and Forest of the Dead. Absolutely gripping television. That is by far the best New Who story I've ever seen. Um, it's just so gripping. And River Song, it keeps you guessing. It's, it's just Russell T. Davis writing, uh, even though Stephen Moffat wrote that. But the, the arc of the Dr. Donna and everything that's going on in this series, it just all comes together and brings the whole Doctor Who universe together in the series finale with Tortured and the Sarah Jane Adventures and Rose coming back. It's just like... It has everything that I loved from every other series, and it culminated it all, co combined it all <laughs> into one big epic story. And I think, as Russell T. Davis's last series, it really has the impact. It's like everyone's here. You have Martha, you have Rose, you have Camille Kajori as um, Jackie Tyler, who I absolutely love. She's so funny. I read an interview with her about her costume, which is quite funny, in series one. And she's just, like, talking about how Jackie chose comfort over style, which I can't exactly hold her against. I mean, you know, you go what you want with... Go with what you want. Um, but, yeah, that series finale is so... Is, is by far one of the best finales of television I've seen. And this is by far one of the best full series of television I've ever seen overall like i mean i've seen a lot of television in my time trust me being in a generation that um has become infamous for spending so much time on television and computers and so on i've seen a lot of tv in my time and this is by far some of the, the best series that i've ever seen in my life just every element works the music the the acting like every story is impeccable and, like, from Partners in Crime, which is just, you know, like, the best season opener for me, if I'm honest. It is the be the ultimate series opener. Uh, just, it feels new, but also you can relate to it. With, as a viewer who'd watched the show for the previous 
few years. I think this is the closest we're ever going to get to an Avengers Infinity War slash Endgame thing in Doctor Who. But yeah, this is a great, it's a cracking season. By far, the best writing, best soundtrack, best acting, the chemistry between David Tennant and Catherine Tate is amazing. I mean, Donna Noble by the, herself, like, she deserves a spin-off series. Like, come on, who would not watch a spin-off series with Donna in it and, and maybe Graham or um, Will? I mean, like, Will, just hands down. Will is, like, one of the best things to come out of New Who, you know? So, yeah. Series four, number one. So congratulations to series four, I'm, I guess. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. I hope this has been an informative video, I guess. Um, um, please remember to like, comment and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Um, and who, who knows, I might do some other interesting content. Maybe rank the doctors. Like, suggest rankings down in the comment section below if you want, I guess. But anyway, yeah, thanks for watching and goodbye.